All right, friends. Good morning. Let's uh, flip over to 1 Corinthians 13 this morning, continuing through the letter to the Corinthians from our brother Paul, inspired by the Spirit. So 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sure most of you have heard of that before. It's the love chapter. It's the wedding chapter, right? It's the Valentine's Day card chapter. It's all those things. And it is fun, and it's actually written, written quite poetically and so forth. But uh, for our intents and purposes today, uh, we're going to look at where it's at in the other chapters. And in this case, it's sandwiched right in between two chapters that are about uh, spirituality and exercising the gifts of the Spirit, right? So that's important to us because even though we use it, and oftentimes appropriately and, and romantically and excitingly in the context of relationships to one another, it's, it's, it's important to look at the fact that it's actually how spirituality works and how spiritual gifts are supposed to work. Does that make sense? So it's not just this abstract, singular chapter that's just kind of floating around that whenever we want to talk about love and what it's like, we can turn there, or we can do that. It's about how Corinth is supposed to be operating and relating to one another, and so therefore us too. Now, uh, not to spend too much time, but as you guys know, and the whole gist of the, the letter here to Corinth is a response from Paul to the household of Chloe, addressing a lot of problems. And all those problems boil down to one thing. Individuals, and it seems like generally, in the body there, are acting immaturely, and they're acting selfishly. And so because of that, they're doing things like suing one another, they're, uh, they're doing things uh, and boasting about sin that's going on in their gathering, uh, they're, they're not loving one another in a physical sense, they're, they're uh, engaging in, in premarital sex and these things that, that tear down the body, all these different things are going on. So it stands the reason if, if you're living selfishly in every other place in your life, or remember we're speaking generally here, that when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, one might be tempted to do the same thing. Now the gifts of the Spirit, and this, I, I, one of the great things about chapter 13 is it helps to clear up, I think, so many difficulties with how the gifts are exercised and uh, how they're manifested and the power behind it and all of that. Because I think, I don't know about you, but we'll talk about it more, but I, I was taught and kind of believed a lot of really weird things about uh, a person, if they do or don't have love in their heart, and how that works. So Paul here, uh, in, he ends chapter 12. If you remember from last week, he's talking about the gifts and how as a body we build ourselves up in love. And uh, that's from uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. So that everybody has this gift, that every part of the body gets to contribute, that everybody has different gifts, and that God's placed each person where he would want them to be. Remember, we're not saying that there's some sort of like sovereign thing where uh, nobody can be out of the will of God. We're just saying that God speaks to our hearts and tries to bring us where he would like us to be. And we can obey that or we can not obey that, right? But then when we are in a gathering and when we're operating in, in love and how God has called us to operate and the giftings he's given us, that we get to contribute to this eternal thing that he's building, which is his house or the bride of Christ or Christians or you know, however the, the spiritual temple, all the ways that the, the allegory works in the Bible. But he ends chapter 12, and this is where we'll pick up. And he says there in verse 31, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging, clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can uh, fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, excuse me, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, literally there it's self-immolation, I set myself on fire, that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, these, these things that we're considering today and these ideas, they're very important for how we relate to each other and how the gifts of the Spirit get used. When he says there in the end of chapter 12, I show you the most excellent way, literally it's the path. I'm giving you the path, he says. This is the most excellent. In the Greek, it's like supra excellent. It's like super duper excellent. It's kind of like if you were going to say it in like a child vernacular. 
It's the most excellent way, and it's the, the, the vehicle and the venue that we could possibly interact with. And this is going to come, or interact by, I should say. And this will come down all the way to the end of the chapter. Just for context's sake, we'll, we'll read it now where he says, verse 13, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So I understand the poetry of that, but let's take a moment and let's, let's diagnose what that says. We have faith, right? How do we get saved? We get saved by grace through faith in what Jesus did at the cross, right? And and then after that, we have hope. Well, what is hope? Hope is we expect, right? That's what biblical hope is not, oh, it's not desire. Like, I hope I win the lottery. It is expectation. So when we say as Christians, my hope is in Christ, we're not saying I really desire for Christ to do good for me. We're We're making a very valid biblical statement I expect Jesus to do what he said he would do. Not because I've done anything, right? Not on my merit, because he said he would. He's the Lord, and he's made promises. So in this life, we got saved by faith. We walk by faith, meaning that when we walk and when we're going through this world and we're considering and thinking through things, that the filter by which I consider my own thoughts, the thoughts around me and actions in these things, is based on a trust in what Jesus said. So if I see something in me or somewhere else, it's incongruent. It's not congruent with what doesn't mean the same or, or respond in the same way or generate the same fruit that Jesus says, then I go, that's not true. That's not right. I can reject that thought out of my own mind or someone else's mind or whatever, right? So I live, I was born again by faith. I live by faith. But then also I'm told I have hope. I have an expectation. I have an expectation in this life that Jesus will do everything he said he would do in my life. I have an expectation that he will bring me safe into the next life, that either by death or by rapture, that I will one day be with him forever. But Paul sums this portion up by saying this. There's these three things that abide right now. We have three things right now. We have faith, we have hope or expectation, and we have love. And he says the greatest, the mega, mega, the most big part of our life, or what it should be, is love. And the reason is, in the preceding verses before this, he says that faith and hope, literally, the the word there for when he talks about faith, will one day be wiped out, and that hope will one day stop. So when we get to heaven, faith and hope will cease to exist in our lives as they are now, because what we were trusting Jesus for is completely accomplished, and what we expected him to do, he did. Does that make sense? So right now we look towards heaven with faith and hope, but then we'll only look back with love. So the greatest thing that we have in our midst, because what is our context? Our context is when the church gets together, right? That's what he's talking about. So when the church gets together, he's talking about how we can relate to one another and how we should relate to one another in hope, or excuse me, in love. Because eventually when we get to heaven, The only thing that will come out of our meetings together that will abide, that will continue, that will be something that we built with and now are continuing to build with and experience is the love. Now, what what does that mean? Because you have agape love, you have uh, uh, phileo love or Philadelphia, you have, uh, which is like brotherly love, you have eros love, which is like erotic love, and you have like storgy love, which I always forget, I think it's like familiar love. So you have these four words that are used in Greek for love. But agape is moral love. So it says God agapes the world. I'm throwing the S on there. It's not actually in the Greek. But God agape the world, or agapeo the world. So he looks at the world, and he loves the world. It doesn't mean that he always feels fuzzy about the world. We know that. We've read the Psalms. It doesn't mean that you know all, all the things that we can attach to love and so often gets attached to this, this chapter. And I'm, again, I'm not trying to mock or minimize using it in a wedding. I think it's great. I'm just trying to point out that we often look at this as kind of the fuzzy, wuzzy chapter. You know, we read it and we just feel so good and we're like, oh, definitely 53% of marriage don't end in divorce. And we, you know, and we get this like airy-fairy idea. And instead of coming back to like, what is he really saying? Because if love never fails and you know, all these things that we have, what is he really saying? He's saying that moral love, the love that looks at another human being, I know we define this a lot, but I, I think it's important. I could be wrong. You can let me know. But, but moral love that looks at a human being, so God looks at all humans, and he does not condone, accept, or validate everything that people are doing, 
and everything they've ever done, but he looks at that human and he says, I want the best for you. That's what agape love is. So that's why as, as human beings, right, and he defines himself, God is love. He defines himself as that. The attribute that God uses as an autobiographical statement is I am that. That is his essence. It's, it's who he is. It's not a feeling that he has. It's not that one day he's that way and the next day he's kind of chapped. No, he is love. So he's called us to walk in. He's called us to a path, right? A road that he says there in the end of chapter 12 where we're, we are operating and building each other up and, and interacting with God and interacting with our schools and work and stores and all these things where we're looking on every single person, you know, the worst terrorists in the world and the, the, the best person that you can think of in your mind, and we're saying, I don't condone or endorse or, or validate everything you've done, but I love you. I want God's best for you. That's why we can look at a child molester, you know, people that we would deem as the worst sinners in the world, and we can say, God loves you. You cause a lot of destruction, but you're not beyond his love. You're not beyond his care. And so we, we rejoice in justice and all those things. I'm not saying we wink at those things. We'll talk more about that. But so when, when Paul is writing to us by inspiration of the Spirit in regards to how we interact in a, in a worship meeting or when the church, the ecclesia, which is the Greek word for church, or I, I guess I should say our English word church is the is from the Greek ecclesia, which has nothing to do with our building. It's literally the called out gathering of God's people. So the ecclesia, the, the called out people, when, when we get together, when the church gathers together and we're interacting with each other, he says that the way that we should be interacting, the origin is from love. This is not something that we look to achieve. He's not calling us to better behavior per se. He's calling us to actually experience and and think from and act from a place of love, right? Now, we know that we're only able to do that because of, you know, we've read in the past that he's given us of his Holy Spirit, right? We have his Holy Spirit who has attached himself to our souls. The Bible says that, that, that he uh, has sealed us, that he fills us. You know, we talked about that last week. So now through his Holy Spirit, this supernatural power, the word there, dunamis, where we get our word dynamite, this supernatural power that we have attached to our soul, fueling our soul, encouraging our soul, leading our soul, and then you know, manifests through our mind and our bodies, that we can actually do that. That's what's being said here. So now he's going to go in and he's going to talk to the Corinthians, and these can seem like weird things to say because we just read a bunch of negative stuff, right? But he also just listed a bunch of gifts of the Spirit. He says there, if I speak in the tongues. So of men or of angels. There's kind of two, there's three ideas here. And there's two ideas about tongues in the scripture. The first idea about tongues is in Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit fills them, and, and they all speak in different human languages. Remember that? I think we touched on it last week, but they all just begin to speak, and supernaturally, whether they were speaking that language or people were hearing that language, whatever it was, they were able to speak in tongues, and all these people that showed up were like, wow, I'm hearing these people in my native language, and they get saved, right? So that's the tongues of men. Then you have this idea of the tongues of angels, and, 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 and this is disputed about what, what Paul is saying. Is Paul saying here, literally to, like, where we would say as a, uh, as a gathering that believes in the gifts of the Spirit, where we would say that like an angelic tongue or a heavenly tongue, which Paul's going to talk about quite a bit actually in, in, in chapter 14, which is the idea he says that a person who speaks in an, in an unknown tongue, not of men, but in, in, in a heavenly tongue, that that person edifies their own spirit. They don't even edify their own mind, meaning they don't necessarily know what they are saying, but they're speaking in a tongue that's from God, and then in a corporate gathering, there is, we'll look at this next week, there's an interpreter. And if no interpreter, if no one says, hey, I know, what that, I, know, I know what that means, and then says it, that the person who spoke in the tongue is not to speak again, is what he says. But for our intents and purposes, where we're at today, is the idea, is he saying that, that if I speak as, if I'm able to speak with a gift of any language I want, or if I'm able to speak with a heavenly tongue, or is he saying, and this is, you know, maybe it's both or either way, we remember this is a Greek. This is a Greek culture that's now taken over by the Romans. 
So one of the most substantial things in Greek culture, one of the most respected things you could do in Greek culture was be like a philosopher and orator, somebody who spoke eloquently. It was very, very important to them. Eloquent speaking was very important. And, and let's be honest, we're not saying eloquent speaking is bad. If somebody's trying to communicate an idea and you can't understand it, that's not worth much, right? So there's something to be said for someone who can communicate an idea in a way that we can understand it. But what's happening here, remember our context, right? Context, context, context. They are using the gifts of the Spirit. They're using the finances that God has blessed them with. They're using uh, all sorts of things for themselves. They're acting selfishly. So when he starts bringing these things up, he's speaking to a church that's acting selfishly. And I'm sure if we went around the room and we polled you know, the, the whole room, that probably each one of us have a story where we appeared to be spiritual. We wanted to, anyway, appear to be spiritual in front of another person because we wanted them to deem us as being intelligent or spiritual or have respect for it or something like that. So the idea that people are trying to use gifts to gain notoriety in their church, this is not foreign to us, right? This is not like, oh, I can't believe that would happen. This is kind of a regular thing. So when he says here, he says, if I speak in tongues or if I speak of the men of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So he makes the point that if a person is doing these things, which they were doing, right? Because if we go back to chapter one, what does he say in chapter one? He says, you guys have all the gifts. God's blessed you with all the gifts. So we know they had prophets there. We know they had people speaking in tongues there. We know they had every gifted individual there at Corinth. So we know that there were people in Corinth, and evidently there were people in Corinth that were operating in their gifts, but they were doing it without love. So Paul's making a point to them. And here's the point. If I do something from a selfish place, it's for personal gain, right? If I want to appear to have clout in the church, why would that be? Because we like to be well thought of, number one, right? We like to be respected. It can come from a very broken place where we just are proud and we want everybody to know how great we are. We can just be, want to be validated that, yes, you are actually really great. You know, there can be some really broken and sinful places that this can come from. So is, is Paul, what Paul is saying here, in the economy of what really matters, if you're doing and using those gifts, but you're doing it without love, that before the Lord, you're a clinging symbol. Now, why do I say that? Why, isn't it between, why wouldn't it be the object uh, or the people that they're speaking to? Does that make sense? Because you have probably noticed that you can have some incredibly successful ministries. And so we'll define successful. Successful in the sense of people getting saved people being discipled, people going out on the mission field, right? You can have some incredibly successful ministries. And then you find out, oh, wow, that dude's been having affairs for 20 years, right? Oh, wow, that dude's been ripping off money for 20 years. Oh, wow, that person's been, you know, fill in the blank for the last 20 years. But yet when you look at the ministry overall, what's happening? It's flourishing, right? People are getting saved. People are coming to Christ. See, because I don't know about you, but I was always taught through this, like, well, if you don't have love, your ministry will just suck. But that is not the truth, is it? You can have an incredible ministry without love. You can help tons of people without love, can't you? If you go up to someone and you give them a word of prophecy and you exercise that because God's given that to you and they are blessed, then they get blessed, right? See, so the crazy thing about God's word is powerful. It really is powerful. And when it's shared in a way that, that is understandable, you don't have to love someone to do that, do you? In fact, you could be angry. You can be all sorts of emotions flooding through you and no thought given to, I really want the best for these people. Shoot, we can even give the word in spite sometimes because it's like, get away, what's your problem? Right? And they get blessed by it. So we have to stop this idea that if you don't have perfect love in your heart, well, your ministry, it's just, it's just not true. In practicality, it's just not true. Will there be issues? Of course there will. But to, to, to make this weird statement that, well, Paul's saying, if you don't have love, then everybody who listens to you will just think you sound like a clanging cymbal. That's just not true, and we know it. So the issue here is, because the core issue of all of this, of our whole lives, before ministry even comes into view, is what? our relationship with Jesus. So Paul says, if I'm doing these things, or if you're doing these things in the church, he doesn't say the church will have no benefit. 
He says that you will be, this is what you'll be like, a clanging cymbal. You know, it kind of reminds me of in the Old Testament where multiple times God says to Israel, stop sacrificing to me. He says, stop sacrificing to me. He goes, because you don't mean it. And so you're not benefiting from it before me. And so there's, in this case, it's a similar thing. You can use your gift and it can work for the betterment of the body. But before the Lord, we're like a clanging cymbal. Everybody else might just be like, wow, that really blessed me. But the Lord just says, you're not in tune with what I'm doing. You're just clanging a cymbal out there. Because the foundational portion of, what, of everything that we do is love. Because love will be the only thing that there is from us in the end of the age. All the other things fade away, right? So we need to be operating out of that. We don't want to be a clanging symbol before the Lord. He gives another example. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and these are gifts he just listed, right? He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and that one is what? A gift of prophecy is being able to share an appropriate word to someone in appropriate time. That's the general idea of a prophecy. It doesn't be, thus saith the Lord, it shall rain in three hours, right? That doesn't necessarily have to be some sort of prediction of the future. It's just ministering God's word to people in a way that they're blessed and they get it, right? And and it was specific for them in the moment. So Paul's saying, if I have this gift, if I haven't exercised this gift, right, and can fathom all mysteries, anything you ever want to know, when was the flood? Who were the Nephilim? Right? All these things that plague us at night and dictate our salvation. <laughs> Sorry. It just kills me sometimes. It's like, if you're not new earth, then you're not saved. You're like, really? Because I thought I got saved by believing Jesus died for my sins. And I thought that Paul just said, we believe by faith that God formed the earth. It doesn't give any more details. So that's what I thought. But anyway, sorry about that soapbox. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, so if I have prophecy, if I, can under- if I can fathom all the mysteries, so I know every single thing of every page and exactly what it means, and I have all the knowledge, meaning understanding, I, I have I have, of all the understanding I can have, right? And we, and we, he talks about getting gifts of knowledge, that God gives us supernatural gifts of knowledge sometimes when we're, when we're trying to help people. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. So he says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and, I'm, and I have all the understanding of everything God wanted to say through his word, I understand all of it. If I have... Um, if I have this gift of faith, in other words, like I just, in every moment of my life, I just know in every situation, everything's going to be fine. I never worry. I'm never sweating anything. I just trust God on every level. I have that gift of faith. And then he says, uh, lastly, after the gift of faith, uh, if I have, or I'm sorry, the gift of knowledge, he says, I, I can move mountains. That would be impressive, I mean, ultimately. But he says, no, if I could literally move a mountain by just trusting God. He says, but if I have love, notice he doesn't say, Nobody will get anything out of it, does he? He says, I am nothing. That's really important. He doesn't say nobody will be encouraged by my prophecies. He doesn't say nobody will get anything about my incredible knowledge. He doesn't say nobody will be blessed by my faith as as we move forward and say God is able. He doesn't say that. He says, I am nothing. Literally, I am immaterial. I am the essence of nothingness. There's no substance to me is what he's saying. So the point is that if we are acting and responding in ways that we're not working out of love, he's not saying that these people won't be blessed. He's not saying that these people won't be encouraged. He's saying that as far as our substance and who we are before the Lord is nothing. That we are not generating anything with Jesus. We're not generating relationship. We're not generating any of that. So if my... If my ministry lacks relationship, that will typically have other problems, right? If I don't have a relationship with Jesus, that'll form other difficulties. Maybe you've experienced this or you observed this. Someone gets saved, right? You see someone comes into the body, they get saved, and and they have this incredible zeal, right? And they, they, they get saved from whatever they get saved from, whatever their life was like. But they come in, and it's just like, Jesus, right? Just, they, they got the shirt. They have the bumper sticker, which I'm not mocking those things. I'm just saying they have it all, right? They're rocking it. And they get involved in every ministry. They're emptying the trash, and they're greeting people at the door, and, and they volunteer you know, everywhere, and they do all these things. But they don't 
as far as you know, or as, as it doesn't come out until later, they don't actually generate a love relationship with Jesus. And you know that because pretty soon they're measuring other people. Well, I take the trash out. I minister at this place down the street. I do this, I do that. And they have this huge list, and they point to it. And they go, do you see my love for Jesus? Do you see my zeal? You don't have that. What's your problem? And it's weird that a person that gets saved can, can make, do all, in a sense, in one sense, can do all this good in his kingdom and bless all these people. But in the end, because they never loved, they never grow to love Christ and to know Christ, their ministry becomes nothing. It becomes detrimental instead, doesn't it? Because it becomes this place, uh, it becomes a, almost like an altar from which they can measure other people. We can measure it. It's not they, it's us, right? And so Paul's just making the same arguments here. He's saying, look, the most important thing in this is the love. We can do all the ministries, but if we don't have the love for Christ and for one another, we're nothing. He doesn't say you're worth, your, your ministry is worthless. He says, you have nothing. You become devoid of substance in your own personal heart and life. That's what he's saying. It's been well said many times that the Lord cares more about the minister than the ministry. And that doesn't mean like the dude who, you know, sits up here and talks. It's you guys. He cares more about you than he does about what you do for him. Does that make sense? He saved you to have relationship with you, not just so you can be like, he can like hire another saved person to go into his work. The ministry is supposed to be a blessing and an outflow from the relationship, from the love, and not vice versa. But it isn't a time to say there, that isn't to say that there isn't a time that we obey not out of emotion or feeling like it, but we obey because we know that he's real and he loves us. So he's going to go on from there. Oh, I, well, let me just give the examples that he gives. I'm sorry. Verse 3, if I give all my possessions to the poor, there again, if we were to give everything we have to the poor, and I know philosophically we can get to a big argument about, well, if you just give people stuff, then they don't earn it. That's fine. I'm not even, he's not even talking about that. He's talking about great personal loss. That's the idea. If I gave everything that I have to the poor, that would be great personal loss to me. So he says, I can suffer the, great, you know, the greatest personal loss on the earth materially, and, and, and they'll still generate nothing in me. I'll still be devoid of substance if I don't do it with love. And then he says, I can, I can devote myself to be, to be burnt, to, to self-immolation, uh, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So he says, I could offer my life, essentially. I could offer my life for Christ. And that might encourage people, and it did. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, the encouragement that other brethren got, for the, the, or I shouldn't say got, but made them more bold is incredible. When you read about, like, when you guys are familiar with, like, Tyndale Press, right? They make Bibles and so forth. Well, when you read about William Tyndale, he was, he was like kind of a pioneer. He was somebody who was translating the Bible out of Latin into um, uh, uh, Greek. Ironically, they used to sit in pubs. There were three of them. And they would sit in a pub, and they would have pub food, I guess, and they would translate the Bible from Latin into Greek. And they did it in pubs because it was illegal. And, and the Catholic Church was hunting down anyone who tried to bring the Bible out of Latin. And so they knew that the penalty for that was to be burnt at the stake. And so they made a pact with one another, the three of them, and Tyndale was actually sold out by one of his, his guys, one of his fellow translators. But they made a pact that if, 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 if being burnt at the stake was bearable, then wave your arm. And so when William Tyndale got caught, when he was sold out by one of his guys and he got caught, the, the account, uh, multiple eyewitness accounts say that he broke free of the, the guards after his trial in a, in a Catholic church. He, they, he broke free of the guards and he ran to the stake and he hugged it. And so normally they would chain you by the neck and by the waist and by the arms to the pole and they would stack the wood around you. And if they liked you, they used wet wood so you'd die of smoke inhalation. If they didn't like you, they used dry wood so you'd burn to death. Also, if the guards liked you while you were in prison, if you treated them well, they would do you a, a real solid and they'd take a pack of gunpowder and they'd put it right in your crotch so that that way when the flames hit it, it would blow your femoral arteries and you would bleed out in about a minute. So he's up there and, and he's burning 
And the, the witnesses say that his, he begins to swell and he begins to get blisters. And he raises his arm and he just starts waving and he's singing hymns. And then he finally just slumps over into the fire, right? And so I don't know what his heart was. I'm sure it was full of love. But if, you did, if one of us did something like that and the others were watching, it wouldn't really matter what was in our heart, would it? Because we'd just be like, yes. Not yes to a man being slain that way. It happened to women too and to children. Families that taught their, their, their kids the, word, the Lord's Prayer uh, in, in Greek, in their common language, burnt at the stake. But if, it wouldn't matter what was in our heart at that point because just to see someone endure that and to wave and to sing hymns, you can bet that the majority of us would just be like, yes, I'm gonna, if, if, if that guy can live that way, I am in. It would be encouragement to us, right? So he, Paul's just making the point. If I were to deliver my body to be burned, which honestly in the next 150 years is absolutely what's going to happen, run through by gladiators in, in the Roman Colosseum, burnt at the stake, strung up, thrown into holes, all sorts of things. And, they, and that encouraged other people to embolden their faith. But he says, if I did that and I didn't actually love God and love the people, I would still, it would profit me nothing. I would just exist. He's going to go on from there, and then he's going to give us a definition. And it's important that this definition, this list, it's not something that we look at and go, I want to try to do that, because this is, it's an impossible list. And the list here is, we have to look at the origin of the list, and not just its subject. In other words, what, what love is upon, or what, what love looks at, but where love comes from. Because love comes from God, right? It's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So if I want to be these things, he's not calling me to look like these things on the outside, although there's a time for that, definitely. But he's calling me to be these things. And that only happens by supernatural change through the relationship of loving God and knowing God and experiencing the Holy Spirit. It only comes through repentance. So he says here in verse 4, love is patient, I mean, just right out of the gate. You cannot make yourself be patient, right? You can manifest patience in the sense that you can feel the rise inside of you of impatience and be like, I'm going to be patient, <laughs> right? But the fact that you have to say to yourself, I will be patient, means that you are impatient, right? And so is it good to exercise external patience? Of course it is. For all of our sake, it is right? But the, the better, or what God's calling us to, is to be patient. So if love is the essence of who God is in his core, and if his Holy Spirit is in me and shedding love in my heart, that when I feel impatient, the first part of becoming patient is acknowledging where that impatience comes from. Because it's nobody's fault but mine. It's not my kid's fault. It's not the person going 15 and 35's fault, Right? It's not their fault. If I exhibit patience, impatience, it's my fault. So I have to acknowledge when I experience impatience, I don't want to pawn it off. I don't want to say, well, if I'd had a Snickers or if this guy was going faster or if this or that or that, that's not true. I'm impatient because I am a fallen individual with a rancid, sinful nature that loves itself and will do anything to make sure it lives, right? Right? That's why I'm impatient. That's why we're all impatient, because that's our nature, is to be impatient. So Christ creates a new nature in Christ by rising from the dead and, and giving us of his spirit, right, to be partakers, uh, digesters, all the different metaphor that we have in Scripture of how we interact with his Holy Spirit to then be changed. So when I find myself being impatient, what I say is, that's from my fallen nature. That's from what I've witnessed in this fallen world. And it's the pneuma, the same spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. So impatience, every time I experience impatience, I have to be honest, it is not from God. No human being has ever been impatient on the planet, and it was from God. It's never happened, because love is patient. Instead, I have to say my impatience is from me, this world, and Satan. It's satanic by nature, which is hard for us. Because it really forces us to take a hard look at who we really are. But there again, you know, when we receive a, a, a good diagnosis of what's wrong with us, it only leaves room to go up, right? To, to, to build on that, to, to, to turn towards that. 
So as soon as we see something like patience and we go, hey, you know what? I have to acknowledge that for what it is. And then after that, I repent. And this is what repentance is. It's just saying, Lord, that was what came out of me. I know what you are calling me to be. I know the spirit that you've given me. And that was definitely not of your spirit. That was of my spirit. And so you know what? I'm turning from that. Not, and now I'm going to feel patient because that's probably not true, right? Those of us who have repented even one time know that oftentimes, usually, you don't just go, I repent of that. And then you're just like, patience, you know, explodes out of your head. And you're just like, yeah, yeah, patience, patience, patience. You know, it's not really real. But what is real is we go, oh, I'm not going to do that. And then the person that we were impatient with, we ask for forgiveness as Christians. We go back to him and say, you know what? I treated you as if I was something. And I'm sorry for that. Because you know what? Only Christ gives my value. And you have the same value as me. And so I apologize. Please forgive me for the fact that I treated you as inferior to me by being impatient with you. It might be a little simpler for your kids when you said, get out of here, you know, or whatever it is. But that's what we're communicating, right? I acted in a way that was antichrist. And I want to ask you to forgive me for that. And, and, and I want you to know that I was not a good representation of Jesus and that he's not impatient with you and I shouldn't be either. And that you have great value. And that, that's what repentance is. That's what it really is. And then we again, and, and, and the next minute when we're impatient again, we say, Lord, forgive me for that. Now, we don't ask for forgiveness because we need justification, right? This is important. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are justified. It's past tense. You've been justified. You're seated in Christ in the heavenly places. You've been cleansed. You, all that has taken place. So when we say, God, forgive me, we're not saying, oh, God, please cleanse my sin because I don't want to go to hell. That got dealt with at Calvary by faith. What we're saying is, oh, God, forgive me because I want fellowship and a loving relationship with you from my side. That's why we ask God for forgiveness, to restore fellowship with him from our side. And then, in fact, confession in Greek literally means to say, it's, it's homo logos, and it's to say the same thing. So when we confess, all we're doing is we're saying, yes, God, what you said about me is true. That's, that's what confession is. And repentance is just saying, I'm not going to go that way anymore. I want to walk in what your spirit gives me. So that's our big explanation for repentance and for how we do this. So first, it's patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. So whenever I experience jealousy, if I look at something that someone else got and I go, mm, in my heart, right? I can know that's from me and my bro Satan. That's where that's from, right? Because Jesus never observes good in someone's life and goes, oh, I wish I had that. I can't believe it, right? So this is, these are just honest, hard truths, right? But God gives us these truths because we have hope that he'll change us. They're not truths to smash us because he gives the truth in love so that we'll grow from it. So we can know if I ever experience jealousy, it's not from God. It does not boast. If I ever want people to be impressed with me, if I ever seek for validation about something that I've done that, makes, that I feel makes me superior, that's not from God. That's from me. That's from my old nature. He goes on there and he says, it is, it is not proud. If I look to something in my life or some gift that I have that God's given me or some job that I have or some, anything, if I look to anything in my life and I, and I feel a sense of identity or a sense of accomplishment from it, not in a, not in a, in a it's not wrong to, be, to do things and have accomplished things, but if I find value, my value in that, and I find that it gives me a platform to hand out judgment from, it's not from God, right? It's from Satan and from my heart. He goes on, he says there, it does not dishonor others. I love this. It, love never devalues someone else. It never does. It never says, that person's trash. Love has never said that. Not one time about any person ever. There's never been a trash person on the planet. It's never happened. There's people that have trashed themselves in the sense that they destroy their lives by sin, just like we would. There go I, save for the grace of God, right? So we know that we, if we ever find devaluing another human being, 
that it's not from God. It's from us and from Satan. Satan devalues human beings. That's what his, his name, Satan is, is a title. His name is Lucifer, right? Son of the light. But his title is Satan, adversary. He's the adversary of human beings. And so when I find myself being the adversary of human beings, I need to know what spirit I'm walking in. And Satan's biggest play that he has for us is to devalue. In every example we see, whether it's Job, uh, whether it's, uh, oh, who's the dude with the, the high priest with the, the turban? You guys know what I'm talking about. Who's that? What is that? He stands before the Lord, and Satan's like, look at his dirty claws. I can't remember now. Sorry. But every single time, it's devaluing. That's what Satan does. He devalues. He says, look at Job. Yeah, of course Job doesn't, doesn't do anything against you. You hedge him about. Job's a chump. If you took that away, that's what he would do. He devalues. That's what he, do. it's what he does in our hearts, and it's what our broken hearts do. We devalue. You go, look at that, loser. I can't believe they're doing that. And it's just love has never done that. It's not self-seeking. So love is never, never looks out for number one. Now, is there self-preservation? Sure there is, right? We're going to be careful about what we do. So he's not saying here that, that love never makes sure that you're okay. You have to. You have to make sure you're okay spiritually, right? If you're not okay spiritually, how are we going to help anybody else? So he's not saying that. What he's saying is love does not prioritize self. Love does not say, I'm going to make sure out of everybody in this room that I am the best taken care of. That's not what love does. Love says, out of everybody in this room, I'm going to make sure that everybody else is taken care of. And we'll see what the Lord does in my life and how he, how he strengthens me. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Another one, which I, and I suppose is true for all these, but maybe these are just, you know, being male or whatever. These are just stand out more. Has anyone ever been able to prevent themselves from being angry? No. You only deal with it once it happens, right? Because anger is just a naturally flowing thing. Something you're going on, you're doing your thing, whatever's whatever, and then all of a sudden, you're angry because something else happened. You don't typically think to yourself, should I get angry about this? Yes, I will. Now I am angry, right? No, you get angry, and then what you deal with that decides whether you deal with it righteously or you deal with it unrighteously. So we can know, and we're not talking about righteous indignation. In other words, we're not talking about like, some terrible things happens to a family member, an assault or something, and, and, and you become like, I'm mad that this happened. He's not saying that. It's perfectly acceptable to see a, an event that destroys lives and to look at that and, with anger and to say, this should not be. Lord Jesus, come swiftly. That's a perfectly legitimate anger, right? But it's the idea of petty anger or anger that is for an unjust reason. You said this to me, and now I'm mad, you know, or whatever it might be. So this is another place when we experience that and we say, you know what? You know why I'm mad? Because I have this big giant head and you popped it. And I thought I was really great and you showed me a little bit that I'm not and I don't like that and I don't want that. And so now I'll lash back out at you. Oh, yeah, you know, whatever it is. Or I'll go into solitary silence and I'll pout and then I'll tell everybody on Facebook how bad it was, right? So we're talking about that kind of anger. So he says, love never does that. So if I find that in my heart, I can know that that's from where? Yeah, my heart and Satan. It's, it's important that we acknowledge first it's my heart, right? Because we can't blame like, well, I'd be a perfect person if it wasn't for that pesky Satan. No, we'd be Satan if it wasn't for him, right? I mean, he, we would just jump into his spot and be like, hey, I can be the adversary. I'm good at that. But he prompts us, he, right? He's the pneuma. He's the wind, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. So he's just really good at like flaming, you know, kind of like fanning the flame of my sinful heart. That's where we include Satan in that. And we include the world in it because the world's dancing to his tune and we learn from that, right? It's, it's been well said. As the culture goes, the church goes. It shouldn't be that way, but it is that way, unfortunately. So that's where every time this comes up, I go, wow, that's me. That's my nasty heart. And it's so good when I see that. And, and when I understand that Satan's fueling that, and I can just reject it and go, nope, I'm doing this instead. So there, I repent. I say, Lord, that was petty anger. That wasn't from you. Forgive me. Have mercy on me. It keeps no record of wrongs. Again, now you can see how this is so airy-fairy and so wonderful. 
he is not saying that love is amnesic. That like you got saved and the Holy Spirit filled you and you were like, what? You punched me in the face? Dude, I didn't even know. Like that's crazy. He's not saying that. He's not saying that you, you don't remember stuff. That's not, what he's saying is that when we love a person, we don't treat them poorly based on what they've done. So if, if, if you gave someone 50 bucks and they went out and just got, you know, stinking liquored off it, it doesn't mean you go, well, I don't keep a record of wrongs. Here's 50 bucks, right? The next time they come back, you don't keep a record of wrong. You say, hey, you know what? I care about you. And it came to my attention that the last time I gave you 50 bucks, you got schnockered. And so this time, what do you need it for? Because I'd be glad to go down to, well, Subway closed now, so I don't know. But you know, I'd be go, I'll help you. What do you need? Because I'll, I'll help you, because I love you. I'm not going to say, you know what, you drunken bum, you get nothing from me anymore. That would be keeping a record of wrong. Instead, you just say, let me really help you. So it's not amnesia. That's, that's not true with God. It's not true with us. It's just a, a, it's a, a logical uh, that we don't reject people based on what they've done to us. We don't stop loving them because of what they've done to us. Does that make sense? We don't stop helping them unless they won't have it. And that's, that's a harder, different teaching. But we can't help people that are not interested in our help. It's actually impossible. He goes on there and he says this. He says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the, with the truth. So this is one, I, I, I use this example typically because I've said it and I've observed it many times over again. Not at this church, just other ones. But you'll see like a group of dudes standing in the foyer. And one of the dudes will say this, I know I shouldn't have, but, right? And then it'll be like, I yelled at someone, I flipped someone off in traffic, you know, whatever, whatever it was. And, and we feel like because we prefaced it by saying, I know I shouldn't have, that that somehow makes it okay. And then all the other dudes who've had a similar experience have been like, oh, yes, yes, I know what you're talking about, right? And then, that's not from love. Love never justifies unrighteousness. So it's not to say that love can't empathize with unrighteousness. I understand why you felt that way, and I too have gone through the roundabout in Astoria, right? It's not that. <laughs> but it's the idea that, that you can empathize and say, yeah, you're right. That can be frustrating. That's, that's perfectly fine. But to endorse and to say, I think it's good that you're now secretly boasting about this, in the foyer of our church, that's not good, and that's not from love. So love will never look at unrighteousness and go, yeah. It may empathize and understand, I see why you did that. Like, we can look at war crimes, and we can say, I understand why at certain times and certain places, soldiers collected ears. I understand that, because they're killing your friends, and you're killing them, and that must do incredible things to your psyche. So I understand it, but I can't stand somewhere and say, I endorse that. That's, that's really, that was a really great thing that you did. Not because I hate the person that did it, but because I say that rots your soul. To degrade another human being that way and to look at them as that fallen, as that worthless, I can't endorse that. But I can empathize and understand it. Like I, say, I, I could see how you get there, because that would be a horrible thing to have to, to have to kill another human being on a repetitive day-by-day -day basis. So do you see what I'm saying? Love never is going to rejoice in unrighteousness. It's never going to endorse it. It can empathize, and then it wants to help. That's what love does. That's really, that's really good, too, in our society, where we have a society that is, a lot of it is predicated on victimization. And, and, and victimization is often brought in as, as a identity. And there is victimization in this world, a lot of it, absolutely but we never want to come alongside victims and help them stay victims. We always want to come alongside and say there's victory, there's care, and we can empathize and, and hear, uh, you know, uh, hear the things that have gone, try to help with the things that are going on, uh, support the people that, that have had been victimized, uh, but to, to still speak truth and love and not just, not just stay in a position where we're always saying, yeah, you have the right to hate that other person. You have the right to continue to ignore Jesus in your life because this thing happened to you. You have the, Love doesn't do that. Love always is drawing out. Love is patient and it's kind, right? So we're not being like, get your butt back to church. We're not doing that. But we are saying, hey, look, you know what? 
I get it. I understand it. How can we help? There's victory for you, right? That kind of thing. He's going to go on and says, uh, uh, it rejoices with the truth. It always protects. That's huge, right? Not just like, oh, there's a, there's a, a church shooter, you know, dun, 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 uh, 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 I love, you know, not the romantic, like, you know, I took a bullet for you. It protects in conversations, right? It protects in, in, in instances where someone does something they shouldn't have done. Uh, Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 4. He says, love covers a multitude of sins. And there's something very special about a friend that sees you freak out and still cares about you, right? That sees you have a meltdown or, or receives ill words from you. Doesn't mean, I've seen Facebook posts where it's like a real friend lets you treat them like complete boop, beep, 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 and then still loves you. No, that's not, you know, that, that's not the whole story there. Yes, love will hear those things. And yes, love will, will want to work with you through those things. But to treat other people, try to justify treating people that way, that's not from love. But love definitely protects in a conversation. It doesn't just come out and be like, you know what? I saw this and you suck, right? That's not love. But a love can say, it's like, hey, you know what? I've kind of observed these things in your life and I care about you. And I've seen those things a lot of other times. And typically, like 99% of the time, this is where that goes. It goes to depression and anxiety and, and a rotten life. And I just would, I'd like to help you if, if you're willing for that, right? Love is, is always protecting people. <coughs> love trust. Let me, let me, I'm sorry, let me say one more thing about that. So there's some kind of interesting ideas about what gossip is. And it kind of varies uh, depending on who you are, your family, church to church. And there's something that love protects but sometimes love protects by telling someone else. So we need to be careful when, when there's bad things going on. We don't spread things, right, as Christians. We don't gossip. We don't spread things. But what we do, it's okay to go to trusted individuals and say, you know what, this is going on, and I don't know what to do about it. What can we do? Because that's important. Advocacy, support, knowledge, wisdom, right, from people that we, that we know, those are very important for dealing with problems. So we want to be careful. It's not love protects, therefore anything that ever gets said or done just gets put under wraps. That is not true. He's going to go on there. He says, uh, it always trusts. There again, it's not, this, Jesus said that he did not trust men because he knew what was in men, <laughs> right? And he is love. So this idea is not that love just always, whatever you said is true, Right? One of my favorite sayings is that, you know, in any relational issue, there's always two sides to the story, and they're both wrong, right? Because each person communicates what they saw and what they thought happened. And each person has personal bias and personal emotions and all those things. So when we're, when we're looking at this and when it says love trusts, love always trusts its origin, not its subject. Does that make sense? So love always trusts Christ. It always knows that things can work out. Love always knows that, that God is working in, in these things. It's not that love takes something that anybody says at every time and goes, that's definitely true. I believe you. That's not what it means. That's not even plausible. That's not even real, right? Could you actually go around your entire life and just believe everything that came out of every single person's mouth and then say, well, love trusts, so I guess... Uh, I guess trees do grow in the middle of the ocean. No, it's not real. So love does trust, but it trusts its origin. It trusts God. It trusts uh, uh, what he's doing. It's not that he trusts every, love trusts every single person that comes down the pike. It always hopes. Same thing. Love always hopes. It always expects that God will make good on what he said. So in other words, when I look at a person and I love them, I have the expectation that should that person turn to Christ, he will do everything in his power to change that person. But they have to say yes, right? He's not out there forcing his will on people. So love does always expect. And, and it always perseveres. So love is always there available to do the thing that it said it would do, right? So I can always turn back to God's spirit in my life and I, and, and, and I can always allow the, the, that virtue, uh, really, God, in my life to do what it said, he said it would do. It always perseveres. 
God always perseveres through everything. Now he's going to say, verse 8, love never fails. There again, it's not the, the fuzzy wuzzy, but it's that moral love. To morally love someone, it will never fail them, and it will never fail you. So fuzzy wuzzy fails all the time, but agape love never fails, and God never fails, right? Because he's the origin of this, this love, so it cannot fail. He says, but where are the prophecies? Now, this, this is, can be a little spicy. We've got a couple minutes, and we're just going to roll through this. Where there are prophecies, right, so tuck that away, they will cease. Literally, they will be wiped out. That's what it means. So where there are prophecies, eventually they will be wiped out. He says, where there are tongues, they will be stilled, literally stopped. They will stop all motion. Where there is knowledge or understanding, it will pass away. It's a, it's a derivative of the same word for, for um Cease, where it talks about prophecies. So there again, they'll be wiped out. Knowledge will be wiped out. Or certain understanding, I should say, will be wiped out. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the completeness comes, and that's not the King James Bible, that's when Jesus comes, what is, part, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away child, childish things behind me. So this is important. What Paul is saying, this is, the big, this is the lead up to that sentence that love is the greatest of these virtues. Paul is literally saying to the Corinthians, you're using these gifts to try to achieve something for yourself. You're being selfish in the usage of these gifts. He says, you need to know something. Those gifts are going away. Right? There's not going to be prophecy in heaven because we'll know as we are known. So we won't need someone to tell us a prophecy because we'll know it all. We'll literally be know-it-alls, every one of us. We'll know him as we are currently known. I mean, think about that. You'll know Jesus as he knows you. It's kind of, I don't, I don't even know how to like quantify that entirely. But that's what Paul's saying here in this passage. He goes, so prophecies, they're going to be wiped out. There's going to be no more prof- uh, pro- uh, prophecies. Those, they're, they're going bye-bye, right? Then he says... He says, knowledge. And the word knowledge here is gnosko. It's, it's understanding. It's not perception. It's understanding. The way that we understand things is going to be wiped out, is what he's saying. And he's going to give us, he gives us a, a, two, two analogies here. The first analogy he gives is he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I acted like a child. I thought like a child. He says, once I became a man, I grew up. What's he saying here? This might be hard for us. He's saying that in comparison to loving one another, the gifts are the childish part. That's what he's saying. He's saying the gifts are the immature part compared to love. He's not minimizing the gifts. Okay, so we're not saying that. The gifts are alive, they're in action, and they're important for us. But they are in our immature portion, our this world portion of this life. But when we grow up and we become, become men and women, in other words, when we graduate to heaven whether by death or by uh, rapture, we will put away those childish things from us. We won't have them anymore. So it's, it's, we're, not, we're not trying to minimize gifts. We're trying to maximize love and the need for it. Because if I've predicated my Christian existence among you as being like, oh, that person's so gifted. Oh, look, that guy's so gifted. Oh, this. Uh, and I found my value. I found my pride. I found my, my comfort. If I found all of that from using my gifts, then when I get to heaven, I want to be careful here. There will be lack in that I will not bring experience with me to heaven to point to and say, remember, Jesus, when you did that and you formed that in my heart? Oh, remember that time you were so faithful to them? Oh, I loved you so much. You did so much. It was so incredible. I was so stoked when you did that. I will not have that. What I will stand before Christ with is, I really impressed your people. You're welcome. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, like Jesus is going to be like, oh, wow, that's great. I just wanted you to love them. But if you impressed them, right? That's the point he's making. He's saying, that's immaturity, to rely on identity and value from gifts is immaturity. But, but maturity is to love people. And maturity can only come by knowing Jesus in a personal relationship. 
and allowing the power of the Spirit through our hearts. It cannot come from just doing stuff, just doing the gifts. And then he, he finishes it off by saying this. He says, verse 12, he goes, For now we see only in a reflection as in a mirror, and then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. And, there, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Right? So in this last instance, he says, he says, this is the thing. Right now, we see through a mirror darkly. And I don't know about you, but that, I didn't really understand that for years. It seems like it should be self-explanatory. But, you know, if you go to your bathroom right now and you look in a mirror, you see you, right? Like, perfectly. But here's the thing. I did a little research on mirrors because I love history. And according to, uh, what's his name? Gaius Plinius Segundus. I mean, if I have a son, we're gold. Um, he was credited in about 73 AD with making the first encyclopedia. He was a Roman naval commander and a Roman army commander. This guy's a genius. He's credited with collecting 20,000 articles of knowledge and, and creating an encyclopedia out of it. And so in old Gaius' encyclopedia... He talks about the fact that in first century Rome, they had mirrors, but the mirrors were polished silver. So not many people had mirrors, and the people that did, they had polished silver, and they were blurry. In the, first, in the end of the first century, they began to see, he didn't write about that because he died in 79 AD, but we know from other sources, in the end of the first century, they started to see glass mirrors, but they were very, very blurry. They couldn't really put the metal on the back of it to make it nice, but they were kind of like, it's kind of like when you bought like a you know, that first VCR that had the cord on it, it was like, it was okay, but not great. That's what it was. And so when he says that we see through a mirror dimly, that's what they're talking about, staring into a polished silver tray, basically. So you kind of get an, an idea of what you look like, but you, it's blurry. So Paul says our knowledge and what we do right now, it's in part. It's blurry. We don't get it all. That should be very comforting, right? We don't understand it all. We don't get it all. We're just trying to kind of figure things out. And he, so he says, our prophesying, all that, it's through a glass darkly. You know, it, it, we, don't, we don't get it. We, don't, we do our best. And I'm not trying to say, like, that's how you get saved by doing your best. I'm saying that those of us, all of us that are trying to walk with Jesus, we do our best, right? But we don't see it all. We don't understand it all. And he says, but one day, all, when those things pass away, when the tongues, when the, when the, when the prophecies, when all that is gone, and we're just with Jesus. He's, we'll know everything the way we're known. We'll fully understand it because we'll see him face to face. We'll be like him. So we have this great hope. And we already talked about it, but that's why he says, like, the greatest of these things is love. We won't need the other two once we're with Jesus. They'll be gone. They'll be, they'll be satisfied. They'll be completed. So for us today, what do we do? Whenever we see that we're not loving someone, we repent. We repent. And we ask him to forgive us. We humble ourselves. And we say, well, forgive me for that. Because Jesus told us this in, in John 35, or John 13, 35. He's recorded as saying, herein shall all men know you're my disciples if you love each other. He doesn't say if you have incredible prophecies, if you have incredible tongues, if you have all the gifts and manifestation in your body, if everything's just gifting, 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 then they'll know. He says, no. He says, you know how you're going to stand out from this ludicrous world? If you're nice, if you love each other, if you take care of each other, if you forgive each other. He says, then everybody around you is going to be like, dude, those people are like different. They do something different. Every religion has prophets, right? But not every religion loves by any means. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and your great kindness. Thanks for your encouragement, and Lord, you have great things for us. And I pray for us as human beings that we would be those, we'd be humans of repentance, humans that turn back to you. Lord, thank you for your patience, your kindness, your long-suffering, your expectation in our lives. Lord, thank you for the cross and the forgiveness for your blood, for that wonderful sacrifice, for the power of your resurrection and the Holy Spirit inside of us. And Lord, we pray that we would walk with you this week. We pray that we'd be 
in fellowship with you this week and with one another. Lord, we praise you. You're so kind to us, and we appreciate it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.